All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking part in today's Economic Development and Revitalization Task Force session. I'm Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, and it's my honor to co-chair this important task force along with South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster, who unfortunately could not be with us here today. Over the past three years, our task force has worked in a collaborative and nonpartisan manner on some of the most important issues America faces now and will in the years ahead. Growing our state's economies, creating good paying jobs for our people, and modernizing our infrastructure and ensuring that what we used to call the infrastructure of the future is the infrastructure of right now. We've worked to help ensure states and territories have the federal resources that they need to succeed, especially in terms of infrastructure investment and keeping America competitive with advances in technology. Today's discussion is gonna look at these areas with a focus on building a workforce with the skills to take on the jobs of the future. Right now, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act are providing historic levels of funding for emerging sectors. Across the nation, we are seeing unprecedented investments in electric vehicles and batteries, in energy and high-speed internet, and in semiconductors and other emerging sectors. In Kentucky, we are working to meet the needs of new and growing employers by partnering with these industries and our local governments, school districts, and career and technical colleges. I'm excited to hear from everyone today about what's good and what's uh, working in their states. We're also honored to be joined today for, by representatives from the administration and the private sector. So I'll turn things over to Governor Gordon to introduce our federal partners. Well, thank you, uh, Governor Bashir. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I apologize, I don't have Henry's accent or his voice, but I'll try to sort of make my way through this. Um, it's great to be here with all of you in this NGA winter meeting. Like Kentucky, Wyoming is tailoring its economic development strategy to build a strong workforce for both emerging and existing sectors driven by our state's data forecasting and workforce needs. For example, in 2021, I created the Wyoming Innovation Partnership to ensure that the right people, including education and business partners, are all at the table to develop innovative data-driven workforce solutions. For the energy sector alone, WIP supports training programs in power line technology, fiber optics, substation maintenance, blue hydrogen electrical in and instrumentation technology, and many more things. We are also very excited about an emerging nuclear sector, and we are trying to skill our folks to be able to meet those needs as well. This work is crucial to powering an all-of-the-above energy strategy. As part of our work to attract, train, and retain workers of tomorrow, I'm focused on the housing, education, and child care systems that will be needed to support them. And of course, I'm always thinking about the unique challenges that our rural communities face in finding talent to complete projects. To kick us off in this important discussion, it is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Today, we're very thankful to be joined by the Honorable Gina Ramundo, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Gina and I both served as treasurers and as governors, so it's been it's a truly an honor to have you here as well. Um, we've known uh, each other for quite some time. She understands the role governors have uh, and also brings that perspective to the Department of Commerce. Sherry Liss uh, is the Executive Director of SEMI Foundation, and she will provide us with an overview of federal funding that is make, making America more innovative and competitive in workforce that is propelling along with these technologies. Sherry and I have had a couple of really great conversations about not only uh, community colleges, but also the K-12 system. And the Honorable Dan Bruyette, uh, President and CEO of the Edison Electric Institute, will share his perspective as former Secretary of Energy on how governors can best support an all-of-the-above approach to energy independence and inspire the next generation of professional powering this industry. Dan, it is great to see you again, and thank you for being here. And we'll now hear from each of our panelists. First, let's turn it over to Secretary Ramundo, and I'll look forward to hearing your comments. Well, thank you. Good morning. It's always uh, a special treat for me to be back among governors. People often tease me and say, which title do you prefer, governor or secretary? And it's 
hands down easy governor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is, uh, I still think, the best job, uh, if not in the world, certainly in um, government, in public service. So anyway, I love the opportunity to be here with you guys and appreciate all that you're doing. It's harder than ever post-COVID. Folks are tired, exhausted, major challenges. So I just first want to begin by thanking the governors for your great service. Um, secondly, I want to say some of you know me and have my cell phone because we work together as governors. And you don't hesitate to use it, which I love. Those of you who I don't know or any other colleagues, please get in touch. If there's anything the Commerce Department is doing that you need more information about, that's going too slowly, that you feel is in any way, is any way I can help you uh, with your economic development, with your broadband initiative, please, I want you to reach out to me so I can help you. A couple things I want to highlight, and then we'll do our Q&A. Uh, the Commerce Department is uh, in charge of the $52 billion for broadband, uh, especially rural governors know this. It's unbelievable how many Americans, tens of millions of Americans, still don't have access to high quality, affordable internet. Uh, so you have all gotten your uh, bead applications in on time, which is great, the first part of that. Uh, we're working hard to make sure we get the money out the door as fast as we can to get all of your citizens connected. Uh, I wanted to, that's huge economic development for all the reasons you know. Some of the most interesting, impactful discussions I've had as I've been out and about on the ground is actually with small businesses. You know, we all know the stories of the students who had to do their schoolwork in the McDonald's parking lot. But it's actually small businesses that I've talked to, um, including in North Carolina with Roy, uh, where they say, I can't run my farm. You know, I can't run the small dairy farm, or I can't run my small farm because I, can't, I don't have the internet. I can't order my supplies. I can't predict the weather. So this is, you know, real, and I want to make sure we work in, co you know, concert with you to get this done. As part of that, we think we'll create probably 150,000 jobs just laying the fiber and connecting homes. So we're doing a lot around workforce, and it's hard because most of the people not connected are in rural areas. So it's hard to find the talent and train the talent in those rural areas. We're doing and funding a lot of creative things, including mobile uh, workforce, you know, taking a, a car or a van to the community uh, and training folks. So I'm just putting that out there because workforce is a big component of the broadband work, and I want we have money to fund that, and I want to work with all of you. Second thing, just briefly to highlight, of course, is the semiconductor effort. Happy to answer any questions on that. But in this regard, really, we have to have a national mobilization of workforce if we're going to meet the need. So to put it in perspective, and Governor DeWine and I are working closely on this. Good morning. Nice to see you. Uh, look, just to give you a feel for this, so we have $50 billion to invest to stimulate semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. Right now, you all know there's a worker shortage. We think we will create, I don't know, 300, 400,000 new jobs just associated with the semiconductor effort. That's 100,000 plus highly trained construction workers. Every one of these facilities, once again, Governor DeWine will tell you, every facility is like six or 7,000 construction workers. Uh, and then on top of that, thousands of people to work in the fab. Every CEO of a semiconductor company I talk to, Intel, TSMC, Micron, all of them, tell me the rate limiting factor for the pace of their growth is talent. I've sat down with the CEO of TSMC. I'm trying to get him to grow faster, Taiwanese company. He says to me, Secretary, if you get me 5,000 um, college graduate electrical engineers, I'll go faster tomorrow. So why am I telling you this? We have to partner with you, your high schools, your community colleges, your research universities, four-year colleges. This is almost, I say, in the, in the decade after President Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon, this country quadrupled the number of chemists it produced. It tripled the number of engineers it produced. That's the moment now. We're going to bring manufacturing of semiconductors back to America. And I hope if we do our job together and mobilize around this man on the moon moment, 
10 years from now, we should quadruple the number of scientists, computer scientists, engineers, chemists, et cetera, we produce and create opportunity for Americans. So I'll leave it at that. Just a couple things I want to work with you all on. There's opportunity for you in every one of your states, and I hope we can work together to get it done. Great. Sherry. I'm a good follower. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Sherry Liss, and I'm the executive director for the SEMI Foundation. Um, what the secretary just spoke to is real. Uh, we're looking at investments of billions of dollars around the world, really, in this industry. Um, so I run the SEMI Foundation. SEMI is a trade association for the microelectronic semiconductor industry. We have over 3,100 member companies globally. The SEMI Foundation, which I oversee, focuses solely on workforce development and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives on behalf of the industry. So we're really tasked with trying to build programs and initiatives that will launch all of these students um, looking at diverse communities into this industry. Because we do need upwards of 300,000 people to fill the needs that are coming. There are currently 18 significant fab announcements happening on US soil. That will lead to at least 60 to 70,000 workers in the fab, and also the construction workers, and also the engineers. And the way that we think about this, for every fab worker of those 60 to 70,000 people, we need five times that number to fill the gaps in terms of workers. So this is a significant challenge or opportunity. I'll go with opportunity this morning, looking around this room, um, to really bring folks into this industry. So it's not just about creating alternative pathways. It's not just creating new programs and initiatives, but it's lighting a fire around our nation, around this industry, and exciting students to this. So the K-12 piece becomes critically important, as does the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece. If we look at numbers a little bit across the tech industry, we currently have less than 25% workers that are female. That's kind of a little bit devastating when the population is made up of 52% women. So we need to do some real programs. When we look at people of color and the numbers, the tech industry is low, the semiconductor industry is actually even lower. So we have a lot of work to do when we talk about diversifying talent. We ha also have so much opportunity to pull new people into this industry that don't always see themselves as part of the semiconductor industry. So in our work as an industry association foundation, as a nonprofit in this space, we're trying to figure out how to reach into every pocket around the nation and figure out how to pull in that talent. What do we need to do to be effective? It's critical in order for this to work, in order for these incredible investments to thrive. We need the workers. It's one of the biggest parts. So our work, I'll just briefly touch on what we do just so people have an understanding. We're working in many of your states already. Um, but you know, we do huge campaigns for K-12. We have a giant image and awareness campaign that we've been launching state by state, trying to get kids excited about this work. We have semi-stories. We've already told those stories, short video clips of people, diverse faces within the industry to over four million students across the country with a focus on underserved schools. We have a high-tech U program that gives students access to engineering design kits because experiential learning is so critically important for kids to engage and be excited about this work. We did a Road Trip Nation documentary about this work. We're doing watch parties all over the country. We are doing what we can to light a fire in the K-12 space. But then what? You know, so do we all need four-year degrees to be successful? Not in every role in the semiconductor industry. We build, we're building pre-apprenticeship programs. We're building apprenticeship programs in partnerships with a number of the states sitting around this table already. We are trying to figure out how to create these alternative pathways into the industry to really make a dent in this workforce challenge. And then we're also looking at the reskilling and upskilling side of things. We're looking at the veteran community. As veterans transition from the military into civilian careers, we have to also engage with them and showcase what this industry is from an awareness perspective and also show how those roles that they held in the military actually fit so well in our industry. So we're kind of approaching it from every angle that we can and we're excited. It's daunting, but it's amazing also to do this work um, and I'm happy to answer any questions as we get to the Q&A part. And thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored to be sitting at the table with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Dan. Well, thank you, Governor. And um, <clears throat> let me offer my thanks as well. It's an honor to be with all of you today. And I want to, on a personal note, thank each of you for the good economic work that you're doing in each one of your states. Um, Governor Gordon, you were kind enough to host me when I was Secretary of Energy. Thank you for that. The hospitality could not have been better. Um, Governor Bashir, thank you for signing uh, my certificate and making me a Kentucky Colonel. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and for your hospitality as well. And Secretary, 
Thanks for your good work uh, with the implementation of not only the CHIPS Act, but the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that particular uh, act and the investments that are going to come from it are absolutely critical to everything that you just talked about. Uh, thank you for your leadership with the Commerce Department. It's very much appreciated in our industry. Um, and as we think about what's happening, we just heard some of this with regard to things like uh, semiconductors, chips, uh, the advent of some of the newer technologies, AI, whatnot. Uh, what that means to the electric industry and to each one of the utilities that we represent at the Edison Electric Institute, the investor-owned utilities in your respective states, is additional load that brings more electricity to the load, to the grid. So as I think about this as a former secretary and now as CEO of Edison Electric Institute, uh, I look forward to working with each one of your utilities in your states, your state regulators around this, so that we can develop the infrastructure that's necessary uh, to get that electricity where it needs to go. Uh, that's been the challenge for us in America over the last few years. It's not so much the production of energy. We know how to produce it, and we produce a lot of it. It's getting it from where it is or where it's generated to where it needs to be. And that can be a data center. In many cases, in some cases, it's going to be industrial loads uh, that are going to come in your respective states. I happen to have grown up down in the southern part of Louisiana. I can tell you that it's a heavy uh, industrial state. And those folks are looking to switch from the use of fossil fuels to the use of electricity to power much of their processes. That's additional load as well. So to the extent that we can talk together about not only that type of economic development, bringing that load or bringing those jobs to your respective states, where we want to be partners with you. Uh, but we also want to talk about the labor that's going to be necessary uh, to accomplish those things. And as was just mentioned, I know Sherry and others have talked about this in the past, it really takes all types of skill sets. Uh, I grew up as a young pipeline welder in southern Louisiana. That was my first job. Uh, I was a tradecraft uh, person. I enjoyed doing that. I can tell you in the, in the electrical sector, we need more of that tradecraft, basic electricians. Um, we do need electrical engineers. Uh, but we also need both ends of that spectrum uh, to build out the infrastructure that's necessary to power America forward, to power our economy forward. Um, so I look forward to working with your states and your respective leaders in your states to do some of that as well. But thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's quite an honor to be with this, this, this group, and I look forward to the questions, and I look forward to the opportunity to work again with you. Well, thank you to Dan, and I was just thinking my first job was mucking horse stalls, <laughs> which prepares you for politics. Uh, I, I just want to take one quick moment to note how many governors we have here for this discussion, uh, members of both parties all looking for constructive ways to move forward. That's pretty special in this town, so thank you to all of our colleagues for being here. I now have the enviable task of moderating a Q&A between these uh, esteemed governors and uh, these great panelists. Now, I have a list of some people who have already said they wanted to start with questions, so I'll start with a couple there, and then we'll recognize people as we move. So, um, Janet, would you like to kick us off? Oh, okay. the, the, my sheet says you have a question. It does. Um, give me the question. <laughs> <laughs> How can we get more money? No. <laughs> We've been focusing a lot ever since the uh, American Rescue Plan monies came out on workforce development, expanding apprenticeships in all kinds of trades, but more particularly in renewable energy and in fiber, tra fiber and broadband trades to help support the $272 million that Maine alone has received for broadband expansion. And it's my hope that in as, as sparse a state as we have, with nine-tenths wooded and these funky peninsulas, which is makes it very difficult to do fiber, but my hope is that by the end of this year, everybody in Maine who wishes to be connected, high-speed internet, quality internet, will have that. And uh, so we're happy to be here and talk about broadband and how we're using apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships and two years free community college to train up people in various trades. And uh, we don't have the advantage of a whole lot of money from the, from the Chips and Science Act, um, like Ohio and uh, certain other states have. Uh, where's New Mexico? Where'd she go? Uh, <laughs> uh, but we, we are anxious to attract it. Our, we're planning to use some federal money, a lot more federal money, in uh, resiliency efforts right now. Given the storms, we had three huge storms in December and January. I know every state in the country has had huge storms and obviously impacted by climate change. And we're looking for working waterfront repair, renovations, and resiliency, building up our coastline. It's a little unique to most of the states, but um, 
that's one of our our goals and we're pleased to have uh, to be filing a tech hubs uh, grant uh, and more broadband money bead money those kinds of things but resiliency is our main goal in Maine great next that question wasn't a question it was just hey Maine's doing great <laughs> Next, next question is from uh, Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stiff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Secretary and panelists for being here. Um, you know, I was also commenting how many governors we have in the room today. Uh, it's amazing. We heard there was good food, but. That's right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about critical minerals for a second. Oklahoma is emerging uh, as a leader in the critical mineral supply chain. Uh, we think that's really very, very important to protect our national security by welcoming companies here to the U.S. to try to, uh, you know, sure up our supply chain here uh, and kind of unplug from, from China, the dependency there. USA Rare Earth is, is a company that just moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and they're the first ever mineral to magnet manufacturer in the U.S., and those magnets go into ballistic missiles, uh, EV batteries, um, iPhones, everything. And so we, we have to get more of that processing done here. Um, Oklahoma State University is teaming up with the company, Go Cowboys, uh, to really help with how do we get the workforce for this critical mineral supply chain, and especially some people that have been kind of out of the workforce. They're, they're talking about, uh, you know, uh, getting more women into the workforce to train on the critical minerals. And so I guess my, my question uh, is, you know, how do we partner with, you know, get more community engagement, get more people in this critical mineral uh, workforce, especially from underserved parts of the labor force? And uh, in Oklahoma, we have about 62% of people that are in the workforce, right? And so you've got unemployment, but you also have a lot of folks that are out of the workforce. They think that the um, maybe technology or the workforce has passed them by. So how do we re-engage those, those people? I think nationally, only 65% of people are engaged in the workforce. And we know that's the, <clears throat> the best way, um, you know, you, you know we, we need to be engaged in the workforce. And, uh, and how do we get more people coming back in, especially in some of these industries that are so important to our national security? I'd just offer a couple thoughts on that. Um, First, just to, I guess, further validate what the governor said, the spot price of lithium has gone up 80 percent, oh, sorry, gone, gone down 80 percent in the past 18 months, so, all because of China manipulation. When we are, s and the same, similar thing for nickel, you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt, which we now n n need more than ever, Dan can speak to this better than I can, for exactly what you said. I mean, we need it for semiconductors, but need it for batteries, EV batteries. China totally controls that supply chain, which means they can control us. You know, when they can manipulate, when, when the price of a critical mineral can go, can swing up and down by 80% in a year, that's, that's a scary place to be. So I think what you're doing, which is to focus on this and have some of this stuff either with our allies or even better, in the United States of America. Arizona is also mineral rich. California is mineral rich. Yesterday, some of you talked to the president about permitting. We've got a lot of work to do to make NEPA permitting much more streamlined. But on this point, you know, one thing we're doing with um, semiconductors is we're going to roll out a semiconductor workforce center of excellence, which is job training just for the chip industry, we ought to think about doing the same thing for critical minerals, right? Because you know, like the talent you need for that industry, it's the same thing in Oklahoma as Arizona. So we should talk about putting together like a critical mineral workforce center of excellence. Yeah, th th thank you so much. One thing that I thought was really interesting, uh, I asked the CEO, you know, why he chose Oklahoma. This is a new process, and because of working with our state, he felt like he could get that across the finish line. But permitting reform is so important to all of us states, and I think governors from both sides of the aisle have a unique perspective that we want to just 
we want to have the best economy. We want, you know, infrastructure projects done. And so the more that you guys can push on permitting reform, I think the better. Last point I'll make that uh, I thought was interesting. The CEO told me that uh, their engineers, the young engineers in this new process, we invented it in the 80s, but then we just outsourced this to China over the last several decades. And they had to get engineers in their 80s to come back to train the younger engineers to do this process. They had to get these guys out of retirement to come back in to teach the younger engineers to set this new process back up, which I thought was very interesting. I thought you, I think you might think so too. I don't know that I can add much more to that conversation. Uh, permitting reform is absolutely key to some of this, though, and I know that uh, we all have you know, uh, our sensitivities around things like NEPA and whatnot, those are very important laws. So I'm not going to suggest for a minute that they go away. We, we can make them a little bit more efficient, however. And I think that's an important role for states to play as well. You have such technical talent within your agencies, within your states. And so often, and I'm speaking as a former federal uh, official, so often uh, we miss the opportunity to work with your states and work with those technical experts as we develop uh, either a regulatory process or simply go through a permitting process here at the federal level. So uh, it's another area where we can work closely together. Uh, and I would also suggest too, while critical member, uh, minerals are very, very important for the development of battery technologies or grid scale, uh, long duration storage for the electricity industry, I would suggest too that we might not overlook some of the technologies that we know a lot about today. And one of those is nuclear power. So when we look around, uh, especially from an energy security standpoint, uh, Russia controls roughly 90% of the enrichment capacity in the world today. So bringing some of that back to the United States could be to our advantage as well, not only for the production of, of carbon-free electricity, but to improve our national security as well. If I can add this, to go back to your original question, um, I can approach it from the semiconductor industry, but I imagine it's going to be the same issues, the same ideas. You know, the way that we have been able to engage new workers in this field is really by bringing together a kind of a coalition of partners. It's bringing together industry, academia, but also very important to include worker voice in this to understand what workers are looking for, what supports they need, workforce boards, and the K-12 system. We can't leave out the K-12 system in this work. And when we bring everybody together and really look from an industry perspective at what the true competencies are that are needed, in order for somebody to be successful in these roles, we're learning that we can shift the requirements around hiring. So there's often this mindset, certainly in the semiconductor industry, and I'm sure it permeates across a lot of different industries, that everybody needs multiple degrees to be successful in this work, that everybody has to have at least a four-year or a master's or a PhD to do good work in this field. But we're learning when we really examine the true competencies that there are other ways to do that. There are alternative pathways. So by bringing together those groups, we've been able to open up more pathways, provide wraparound service for, you know, support for workers. And that's the way that we're starting to engage in communities that hadn't even had an access to what this industry is. So that's what we've been able to do that's been successful. And so I just want to share that. Our next question will be from Governor Leon Guerrero. Thank you so much. <coughs> I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit different. Uh, we, we don't have semiconductor um, issues in Guam, but we are busy preparing for the defense of the nation and, of course, our island. And we're out there in the Asian Pacific region. So, uh, but we play a very significant role in defense, security, and also communications. So Google just... Uh, announced a partnership with Guam and where they are going to be moving their cables, the sea cables, from uh, the South China because they see Guam and our area of, as a much more secure, stable um, a place. And so they are going to be laying down cables that would connect uh, Guam, Fiji, Australia, and will also go to the United States and into Latin America. Uh, and, and the importance of this is uh, it will bring information and efficient information, uh, less latency and more broadband from Asia Pacific region over to the United States. So we are, uh, I would say, geographically poised to do that. And that then connects the whole of Asia Pacific which 60% of the population live, 
and it connects Asia Pacific to the United States on to Europe. So we are going to be having a lot of increase and expand industry there in the data world. And I just wanted to know how we can continue to partner or what areas there that you might uh, help us in terms of uh, workforce, uh, career paths, data center, telecommunications. Uh, I want to thank uh, Secretary Ramundu for the BEAD program. Uh, we are pushing that out. And uh, this whole project that we're doing with Google is only going to, again, reach the accomplishments and the goals of uh, President Biden of connectivity, not just to the U.S., but to the whole world. So any kind of uh, concerns we will bring to, of course, our federal partners. Uh, in terms of workforce development, all the ideas and the actions and, and the uh, uh, programs that you have mentioned, we are doing. And uh, I especially loved uh, First Lady's uh, presentation yesterday when she talked about how we need to transform education so that these career paths can be introduced into the K to, through 12. So uh, I think I travel the furthest to come here. I think I spent the most money to come here. So uh, I appreciate all the discussions that I can take home to, again, improve uh, the livelihood of our people, because that's what we're all about, right? Protecting our families, our people, and of course being a major player in the defense of the United States and the people of Guam. Thank you so much. Just qu quickly, uh, I will, I'll follow up with you specifically on Google, because they're doing that work in a few other places, and they are getting to be really quite good at the workforce training, so we can follow up on that. Only other thing to say is, we're spending a lot of time in the Indo-Pacific with allies. I'll be going to Philippine, the Philippines in a couple of weeks for exactly the reason you say. Um, we have to get closer to our Indo-Pacific allies, uh, y you know, to make sure we're not overly dependent on China, which is what we are right now. It's, it's actually uh, pretty scary. Um, we're close to China. And uh, their whole strategy, of course, is to win by social economic um, uh, programs into the islands. So I'm pretty sure their strategy is to control the indo pacom area by providing uh, these social economic um, programs to all the little islands, and uh, because they need it. And so I I'm very excited. Uh, I'm very thankful. I, I have a great communication line with Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell, uh, S Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell, as he is considered the uh, expert in the indo pacom area. Our next question will come from the great state of Montana. Thank you, Governor. And I want to talk about workforce to pick up where Governor Stitt left off there. We, we've been doing everything we can to get uh, – alternative career options down into the high schools and junior highs and younger ages. We now allow the schools to partner with local chambers of commerce so they can send their high school students to job sites for two to 20 hours a week and get high school graduation credit for it. And this is just opening up new horizons. You don't think of Montana as a semiconductor manufacturing state, but we're home to a large facility for applied materials. We ship tens of billions of dollars of semiconductor fabrication equipment to Taiwan. I led a delegation there of our business leaders last fall because we have to stay close to our friends that love freedom. Uh, we also just recruited Vacom, which is a German manufacturer serving the semiconductor industry. Uh, and we're now home to one of the United States only quantum foundries. So we're doing advanced work in photonics. But here's my question. One of the things we've been looking at is workforce participation rates and we've we're in the process, we're not, we don't have conclusions yet. We're studying individuals 18 to 50 years old who are not in the job market. They're not on unemployment. They're just not participating. And I'm curious to hear if there has been any analysis done in another state or by the Department of Commerce of that group and what programs have been successful in moving them from 
not participating to participating. Yeah, two comments on that. Um, one thing we haven't yet talked about here is child care. So the, you all know the numbers, but most Americans live in what, you know, what's called the child care desert. Like there's three times as many kids as there are spots in child care facilities. And COVID massively exacerbated that. I mean, we saw it in Rhode Island. Uh, just so many child care centers went out of business and haven't come back. So to get uh, women back to work in that, you know, age group, we have to get a lot more creative around child care. One of the things we, we're doing in CHIPS is we're saying, if you're a company looking for more than a couple hundred million dollars of money, we want to see your child access to child care plan. It doesn't mean you have to provide the child care. It just means how are you thinking about it as a company? Because we all know, I know Governor Healy's done a lot of work on this with construction workers. You, you can't show up at 6 o'clock in the morning for your shift unless your child care opens at 5 or someone comes to the home or something. So anyway, I, I, people say to me, oh, that's social policy. I don't see it that way. I see it as workforce participation. You want people to show up at work and be productive. You better figure out a way to take care of kids. Yeah, so our, that, our more advanced big. employers are building child care, and we've been prioritizing changing the licensure and these sorts of things. Great. I'm curious that about, have there been any demographic studies of these non-participants, and what are the actual reasons they're not in the workforce? That, that's the one really that we have, uh, I can, we've done some work. The Department of Labor probably has, and I can get you what they have. Mm -hmm. The one thing when you talk to women is this is a huge barrier. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other thing, too, which we haven't talked about here, we've talked a lot about, and all the work you're doing is unbelievable, like you said, going into middle school and high school. The thing that n fewer people talk about is the 45-year-old who needs to be reskilled. Mm -hmm. And I think as governors, you, we together need to focus on oh, the 35-year-old who got let out of work as a bartender in COVID, mm -hmm. and to get a job in, one, in AMD's facility, they gotta figure out how to go to the community college and get adult education. I think there's not nearly enough focus on adult education to get folks retooled, and that's an area um, that I know in studies we've seen it, we've seen it, and we are gonna focus on it, and I, I'd love to work with the governors on it. Our next question is from North Dakota. All right, let me just uh, jump in on that, but uh, on the child care thing, uh, which is it, we uh, agree with uh, uh, Gina completely on this, is, is it is workforce infrastructure. And for governors that have had a tough sell, I mean, if you're in a limited government state like North Dakota where people say, hey, that's not our job to get into, uh, you know, to get into child care, it's a tough sell. But we were able to, we now have the highest workforce participation in the country. We've topped 70%. And our work and research, Greg, was that we, was what Gina was saying, we did a 14 month comprehensive, 35 business leaders, what are the, what are the reasons why people aren't working? And then here we find out, well, we spend all this money, we're, uh, we've got some of the highest high school graduation rates in the country in North Dakota. So we spend a ton on K-12, we spend a ton on our 11 universities, we have more women that graduate than men, and now we finally got jobs for them, so they're staying home when they're starting families instead of leaving our state, our population's growing, but then they're out of the workforce because of these childcare deserts. And so we said, wow, we've invested all this to get them to these four-year degrees, but now if they, want to, if they want to stay home, great. If their dad wants to stay home, great. But if somebody wants to work, the mom or the dad, we want to make sure we've got childcare. So we passed in our little state a $65 million support plan last year to focus on three legs, which was affordability, accessibility, and quality of childcare. And that was comprehensive across all the stuff I know you're doing on licensing and restriction and hiring and everything that you can uh, do. And there are a lot of details happy to share with everybody, but that's made a big difference uh, uh, for, for us on, on that side. And, and in terms of the, you know, the industry with hiring women, I, mean, I just share from my own personal experience, when we, when we got acquired by Microsoft in 2001, the company that, that I was involved with, we had 2,000 people, 51% of them were women. I mean, there was another software company in the industry that was above 25%, but you can, you can get there if you just actually make it a uh, you know, smart hiring approach and, and mentoring programs and all the things that people talk about doing today. I mean, we were doing it 25 years ago. Uh, on the shifting the rare earth minerals, um, 
uh, Secretary Monroe, on your idea that we would have this task force is a great idea. I agree with what Governor Stitt is saying. Uh, but, you know, it's not the three of you that are here. You're all on our side trying to, you know, move these industries forward. But there's other silos in government, you know, that are essentially attacking the mining industry the same way they're attacking, you know, the oil and gas or the uh, baseload electricity industry. And when I say attacking because the rules and regulation are prematurely shutting down our baseload at a time when we need more power than ever before. And you, in this idea that we're in an energy transition is a fallacy. It's energy addition. We need more for, and we, it needs to be cleaner, yes, but we to power all these data centers and what's coming with AI, I mean, the, we're way going to be short of the uh, power to do this. And then when we t talk about China controlling 85% of the rare earth minerals, and then we have, we have people that care about the environment shutting down mining in the U.S., and then China is tearing up Indonesia and tearing up the Central African Republic to get these rare earth minerals. And for folks, they call them rare earth minerals because they're measured in parts per million. You've got to move a million pounds to get, you know, get, get at the mineral. Well, guess where some of the highest rare earth minerals are in the country? Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, in lignite coal that's sitting right below the surface. We're not talking about 2,000 feet below the ground in West Virginia. We're talking about strip the topsoil, pull out a 20-foot seam of lignite, turn that into decarbonized baseload, and voila, we've got some rare earth minerals. If you're not doing the baseload electricity with that lignite, it's not economic to go in and move millions of pounds of, of material to get at those materials. So we have to use innovation to solve the problem as opposed to regulation, which is creating the problem. So I, I just would say there's, there's all kinds of opportunities, but if we have the, the critical earth approach that we're talking about, uh, we, we've got 240 million acres of land that Theodore Roosevelt put away that was the balance sheet of America, and now we act like, the, like we can never set foot on it. But of the 240 million acres, could we develop minerals on a couple thousand, like one one hundredth of one percent for national security? Could we maybe do that? Because guess what? If we do it here, we'll do it cleaner, better, and safer than anybody else in the world. So we, we just have to get over the political hurdles and go solve, solve these problems. But in that case, I, I, know, we, I know we can make it happen. Governor, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. There's such a broad question and such a broad issue. Um, but your points are, are absolutely correct. Uh, the, the, the thing I would point out to you with regard to mining, uh, I've seen it happen in other parts of the energy space where the technologies that are available or will be developed uh, to go after those types of rare earth mineral, uh, minerals or go after the, you know, the lignite coal that will be used to develop the minerals, it, it continues to evolve and it's becoming more and more environmentally sensitive. We've seen that with things like the shale revolution in the Permian Basin down in Texas, where we've become so much more efficient at extracting um, these minerals and extracting the, the fossil fuels in particular. I think we could do the same thing with mining as well, so that we can protect that 240 million acres in a way that I think all Americans want us to do. Your point about baseload, though, couldn't be more uh, important in my mind. You know, we talked about this earlier. I know Governor Yunkin has. Uh, you know, an, uh, an amazing amount of activity coming his way with regard to data centers and, you know, uh, big industry coming in and placing a lot of load. Um, we cannot do it if we retire our baseload facilities too fast. It's just simply impossible. The math does not work. This is physics. It's math. It's not politics. We simply will not be able to meet the load. Now, we can mitigate some of the challenges we might have with the development of additional transmission infrastructure. So if we can take electricity, solar power from Arizona, and move it to the eastern part of the United States, or vice versa, we can mitigate some of the, of the challenge we have, but we will not eliminate it. And I think it's very important for all of us as, as you know, in my case, uh, you know, part of the electric industry now, but in your case, as policymakers, important uh, policymakers in the states, to recognize that. We're literally staring at the edge of a cliff. And if we don't get this right, the lights will go off in certain parts of the country. And when they do, it means the Wi-Fi goes off. It means you don't work from home. It means a lot of economic activity comes to a <coughs> screeching halt. So um, I'm sorry, you want to add to that, Governor Yunkin? Governor Lee and I are falling over each other, um, trying, to, <laughs> <laughs> trying to just, uh, I, I think, uh, amplify this very clear message, which is the the national security imperative of developing supply chains in these most critical issue, industries, in, in, in semiconductors and um, electric vehicle batteries and 
they're all undermined completely by the fact that we don't have a national energy policy. And this is the hard part because it requires us to put down our politics and put the national security interest above everything. And this key point, which is in the Commonwealth of Virginia, our power demand grows at 5% a year. Five times the states around us. And the primary driver of that is advanced technology. And of course, growth. Growth is a good thing. But we can't meet it unless we have nuclear, we aren't forced to shut down our clean natural gas uh, uh, generation, and we can invest in our transmission infrastructure in a way that gets power where it needs to go. We have to have all of the above. We have wind development, we have solar development, we need nuclear development, we need everything. Because that is at the heart of competing for a better America. But Madam Secretary, thank you, and I love the fact that you're a governor because you understand where we're coming from, which is we have to, we have to first figure out how to allow our economies to grow in an unconstrained way so that we can provide opportunity. We have to build a workforce to feed that opportunity. And part of this is a national energy policy that recognizes that this is at the heart of an America with no rivals. We have to return to being an independently energy sufficient nation. Governor Lee. <laughs> That's where I was going. And then, and then we'll go to Governor Cooper. Yeah, so you said a lot of what I wanted to say. But I, what I would say, too, is as we think about this, it really is not an either or. No. Yeah. Uh, we, we really have to remember that. We, we are in a position in our states like Virginia, vastly, rapidly growing, huge increase for power. We, have a, we are working really hard with Department of Energy and TVA and others to bring, bring on a uh, small modular reactor. We have an approved site. We're, we're, we're working very hard to do that. Create an environment, a, a, a nuclear advisory council and a $50 million fund to create an ecosystem. We, we already have uh, in Oak Ridge that, that asset. But we just need more time to get from where we are today to the place where we can generate nuclear power in a significant way in this country, we need more time before all the coal plants are shut down and while the, the transition with natural gas works. It isn't a matter of choosing coal over nuclear, choosing renewables over. We just have to remember there's a, there's a, a process and, and if we just had a little bit more time and if we understood the severity of the problem if we compress that time too short. That, that's all I'd add to that. Yeah, I, I know we're talking about workforce here, but I, I, it can't, can't be left unsaid that we need to get to carbon zero as quickly yeah. as we possibly can. And technology is evolving very quickly. And if we lag, I understand we need an all of the above approach, but if we lag too far behind, we're going to be in investing in dirtier technologies that are going to be sunken costs that are going to end up in consumers' laps. So yes, there needs to be an all of the above approach, but we need to be working quickly to get to carbon zero. And it's why we've, uh, we had a bipartisan piece of legislation in North Carolina that's going to require our power sector to reduce 70% by 2030 and to get to carbon zero by 2050. And if you don't think this country can do that, you're wrong, because we can. I mean, we are, we, we can harness the technology to get there. So I, I know you don't want this debate today, but I just wanted to, to, to put that on the table here, guys, that, that this gets us to the energy uh, sufficiency and the national defense to, to be able to take care of ourselves and I, I look forward to, to us continuing to talk about these power source issues. Back to workforce, maybe. <laughs> uh, I had two other governors that indicated they may want to ask a question. Um, the next question, as long as you would come from the great state of Arizona. Thank you so much. Um, so I, we have a growing workforce in Arizona. We've had welcomed over five, half a million new workers since 2015. And so the opportunity is to just make sure that those 
that workforce is plugged into the opportunities we have in our, our garden economy is, is so incredible. And we've done some really innovative things. We've spearheaded some industry-driven advanced manufacturing uh, 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 programs with our community colleges. Um, and you know, really tapping into the rural communities and, this, and the unique opportunities that are there with, um, with broadband, with um, semiconductor manufacturing um, across the state. Um, I, I want to do more. I want to know how we, can, how we can do more to be innovative with our workforce development programs, how we can leverage public-private <coughs> partnerships, um, and really just harness the opportunities that we have in front of us right now. Happy to start. Thank you, uh, Governor. I think Arizona is doing so much incredible work. Uh, we've been working with the Semi Foundation. We've been working with the Arizona Commerce Authority quite a bit on this work. Um, I think that building the apprenticeship programs with the community colleges is probably one of the most critical pieces, especially in your state. Um, and I know that you're already doing that work, which is amazing. I think the community colleges play a very important role. Um, looking at the amount of growth that's happening on the ground there looking at the number of technicians and operators, making sure that we're mapping the competencies accurately for all of those roles. But another thing that could also support the work there, one of the things that we've been approached by some of the companies on the ground in Arizona is to look at building apprenticeship programs also for the engineering community. And I think that is a really unique opportunity for us as, I mean, us collectively in this work. It is not something that's been done before in this industry, certainly not in the US. And so I think Arizona is actually a really prime place to try to do that and to look at what are the possibilities in terms of engaging that workforce, that diverse workforce on the ground there, to build upon the success you're already having in all the apprenticeship programs, but to open it up to alternative other possible roles that we see within this industry. So that's something that we're hearing in Arizona that's needed. I also know that we're starting to coordinate with the science community there too as well to lift the K-12 system. So there's a lot of innovative work on the ground being funded there as well. Um, but I think this engineering piece is a piece that doesn't get discussed as much um, across the fuller ecosystem. We've really been focusing so much on the fab workers and even the construction workers, which absolutely also need to happen. But the mechanical engineers, the electrical engineers that are going to be needed for this to be successful is a pretty wide group as well. And we're competing with all these other STEM fields. So if we could partner to do something like that, I think that'd be a really powerful win for the state as well. Uh, and Ned was wanting to talk. Governor? Yeah, one last thought on, on energy. Um, I'm from a part of the country, Connecticut, where um, we're at the end of the supply chain. We just met with all the regional governors. Um, we're really worried about capacity, as you say, Doug, over the uh, near term. Uh, affordability, our prices are going up, up quite a bit, and in terms of green, and trying to get that balance right. And energy is something that is um, not something a governor can do by themselves. We have to work on a regional basis. We could take um, some leadership there, as well as on the national basis uh, going forward. I'd say, Gina, you don't have enough on your plate, so I'd like to have a Secretary of Commerce, a former governor, maybe help us in terms of some of these uh, <laughs> initiatives as we go forward. and. And I'd say the same thing, Dan, to you. I mean, ever since we deregulated um, in, our, in our part of the country anyway, um, utilities sort of say, boy, generation, that's your problem. Figure that out. We're going to do the grid. And we need you at the table as well as we try and come up with the right balance going forward. But it's uh, capacity, affordability, and green. And getting that right is getting tricky in our part of the country. So our last question will come from Governor Healy from Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to return to the Secretary's comment at the outset in terms of what you're hearing from the bigs around workforce. And this also follows what you were saying, Sherry, about engineering and apprenticeships. And I'd like to say, we have a state for you. Um, because <laughs> thanks to the work of the administration, we were thrilled to receive the Microelectronics Commons Hub uh, grant recently, which what's so cool about it is that in a state like ours, it basically was baked through a consortium of K-12 vocational community college engineering programs um, as well as state university engineering programs and our DOD uh, manufacturers. We're home to some uh, great ones in Massachusetts. And so we're really excited about that because we think it starts to further 
the pipeline of the kind of uh, workforce we need. I mean, my perspective, and, and I may be wrong on this, um, and I appreciate everything about national security and our independence, and you know, even Janet's got lithium in Maine. So like, w we can talk about that and we'll figure that out. But at the end of the day, if we don't have human beings available to do the work yeah. to fill the jobs that these companies are looking for, we're not gonna be where we need to be. And I found as governor that to get there, it's about removing the barriers. That's why childcare is really, really important. We just went in big, three, four hundred million dollars in childcare grants to expand the number of providers out there. If you want to reach populations underserved, underrepresented, they're working two or three jobs. You have got to make it able for them to actually go to work. K through 12, of course, investment in STEM, all really important, investment in vocational training, but in a way that matches it with early college credits at a community college that then gets you further along to those engineering or coding or what have you, you know, degrees that, that you need. All I think is really, really important. And um, to the point about workforce, while we do everything to try to take care of 17, 18, 19 year olds, it is the case that there is a segment out there looking for a second career. That's why this year in Massachusetts, we made community college free to people 25 and over because we wanted intentionality focused there on you know, that age group where we could bring them in and align them with programs that are already matched with employers ready to go. And it's, I just offer that to you in particular, Sherry, because we're a state that would really like, you know, we would love to see um, investment in a closer you know, lab to fab uh, uh, model. And obviously we're a state that's R&D, a lot of lab, a lot of that. We're really focused on how can we create more opportunities for lab to fab in addition to you know, the great work that is going along in our sister states around the country. But um, I appreciate the, the, particularly the way the, the thoughtfulness of the administration and the secretary in designing the parameters of some of these grant opportunities yeah. that really I think tie together sort of in a big picture way what we need to do to get to where we need to go in this space. And I'd love to talk to you more. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to, to dig into that with you. I, I think I've been pulled into that hub. <laughs> <laughs> I, believe, I, I believe I have uh, Massachusetts on my list and right we, now. We appreciate that. Um, and I'm amazed at the work that's already happening. It's, it's, go, yeah. There's so much incredible work happening around the country, and I think one of the things that we're challenged with right now is breaking out of that silos, out of those mm -hmm. silos and sharing more on a national plan, which I know the Secretary opened with as well. I think that's gonna be really critical for this. Um, but I, I would love to work with you more and I, I do believe I have some calls coming up with the folks that are running that hub. And if I could just take one more second, I'm sorry. Back to Governor Hobbs for a second. I thought of another thing I wanted to say out loud. Another big opportunity in several of the states that are here um, is the idea of a training facility. Um, because one of the things that we're really struggling with, we're building all these beautiful apprenticeship programs that require hands-on learning. And a lot of the clean rooms at universities are used for R&D as they absolutely need to be, but we also need to carve out some training facilities for those hands-on experiences, another opportunity that I see that could really thrive in Arizona that I know is already being, I know it's building, <laughs> but I would love to talk to you as well. I know we're out of time, but just to follow up on Governor Lamont's point, tr it, true, Ned, I'm not the energy secretary and don't need more work on my plate. That being said, that being said, I view these issues of healthcare cost we didn't talk about that today, but higher health care costs for small and big businesses, energy cost and availability, access to critical minerals, workforce, child care, workforce infrastructure. To me, those are all competitiveness issues. Like if we want the U.S. to compete and have the most competitive economy and businesses in the world, we got to work on that. That's very much in my zone as Commerce Secretary. So. I, I, it's so good for me to hear what's on your minds, and I'll see if I can come back and work with the governors on like a business competitiveness initiative, because this is business competitiveness, bipartisan, and energy's a piece of it. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary, and I, I know we all would love to hear and, and look into that much more. Thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks for your patience. We, we talked more than you. Um, but, <laughs> but I think um, um, 
one, one of the things that uh, I think is really remarkable here is how many governors were here. And I just want to point out the conversation was civil, it was engaged, <laughs> and it was focused on solving problems. And, and that's really what makes governors uh, the, great, the great group they are. And I know I don't, Madam Secretary, need to tell you that. Our task force will continue to focus on strong economic development and efficient implementation of new infrastructure, energy, and technology projects over the year. NGA has already produced many resources on these topics, so please go to its website and learn more. Governors are all excited about what we can do together to make things come true. Thank you, and Andy, thank you very much for the opportunity to co-host this with you. We are done. <laughs>